Hey everybody, I'm wearing my hat because I have hat hair from wearing a hat. Anyway, so I'm sort of vain. Uh, here it is. So that's it. That's your sneak peek. <sighs> anyway, hey, I'm standing in my kitchen. Last time I put a video up, I think, I don't know, things were sort of in disarray. But we're moving along here, as you can see. Maybe you can't. Maybe you don't care. That's right. So we have a counter in, which is really nice. And I'm so glad I'm not doing any of this work because, man, I, I've worked on my house so much it's not funny. But sometimes you just get tired. You want other people to do it. And plus, I got these bad knees. Not that I'm complaining. Here's the thing that happened the other day. Um, I've got some arthritis in my knees. And somebody asked me, Pete, how are your knees? And I said, well, my arthritis is acting up. And then I went... Old people talk like that. What's going on with me? Anyway, after a good cry, I was fine. That's good. Okay, listen, the uh, the Ask Pete question for this week was submitted by Julie. And Julie asked the following. I'm going to read this here. She said, over the course of human history, so many people have put out there their approach to interpreting the Bible, living for God, following Jesus, etc., so many teachings, so many books, so many people with opinions. How can we know which approach is right? And just a few brief comments on that. First of all, it's a great question. Um, but first, I think it's important just to acknowledge that there are all these diverse points of view. That alone, I think, is just a sobering thing. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that I hear people, there are well-meaning people say, feeling that what they believe is what the church has always sort of believed about everything, and it's clear from reading the Bible and stuff like that, but that's not true. There are multiple approaches to all these things throughout the course of human history. And I think the reason why we have those is because people are human beings. Stop me if I'm going too fast for you. And we live in contexts and cultures, and we look at God from our limited but still beautiful points of view, based on who we are and when we are. And I think the reality of theology reflects that. It's inevitable, you know, think about it. It's inevitable to have um, all these uh, opinions about everything, right? So at least to acknowledge that they're there. Now the question of which is right, that's another thing. But just to acknowledge that it's there and to maybe even expect it as normal, and that's a lot of what I do in How the Bible Actually Works, the last book that I wrote, about how that process is even available to us in the Bible. We see it by um, how the biblical writers, how they have different opinions on many different kinds of things. So I, I think, first of all, just acknowledging the fact and maybe trying to look at it from a different point of view that maybe this isn't so bad. In fact, maybe it's just part of what it means to be human. We're going to have these different points of view. All right, so what do we do about it? Well, the question comes up, as Julie put it, uh, you know, which one is right? How do we know? And I guess, you know, my, my response to that is I definitely get it. And I don't want to suggest like, you know, anything and everything goes, whatever we feel like saying can be stamped with Christian and it's okay. But I'm not sure if that's the best question to ask. I think that's a question you ask way down the road, not at first. And, you know, here I've learned stuff, and, and, you know, you've heard this. If you've hung out here at the Bible for Normal People, or read some of my stuff or whatever, you'll know where this is going. But uh, something I learned from, from Jews in graduate school, two of my teachers were Jewish, and that's when I first really started getting into Jewish interpretation and its history. And one of the first things that I saw that everybody talks about is how in Judaism, the disagreement and the debate is maybe more valued than it sometimes seems to be in Christianity. That's not true of the whole history of Christianity, but definitely in our time in human history today, and maybe for the past couple of hundred years when the church has sort of felt under threat by all sorts of things, whether it's science or Darwin or, you know, German higher criticism, things like that. So, you know, for us, it's sort of unusual to think in terms of the debate is part of what it means to worship God, but that's very much a part of Judaism that at least Judaism, generally speaking, is more comfortable with. Um, so maybe looking at it, instead of what's, which is right and how do you know, it's thinking in terms of maybe very broad boundaries and then asking, you know, what is... Um, 
what is valued maybe is a way of putting it and what is an authentic Christian discussion within these boundaries. And you're going to get different points of view on what that looks like. And again, I think that's inevitable. But not just Judaism, but also, and I, I put, I think my last video was on apophatic theology. And um, that might be one worth looking at quickly if you have a moment. But about not knowing, not just knowing, but not knowing is also part of the task of theology. And if God is infinitely knowable, and we're just finite creatures, nothing is going to capture God fully, including the biblical text. And certainly not our minds as we try to wrap our heads around the reality of the creator of you know, infinite cosmos. <clears throat> and so, it, again, I look at that and I say, if God is mystery, that means God is infinitely knowable. And how can you not have different points of view about even very significant things? Even things we might consider to be very basic things in Christian theology. And, you know, part of this idea of apophatic theology is that, you know, even when you're right about something, right away you're going to be wrong about it at the same time. That sounds a little bit cryptic, but I think it's true. Anything we can say of, of God, let's say, and of the nature of the Christian faith that has truth is also going to be clouded by our own limitations, and we're going to even erect barriers between us and God. And so, you know, how do you know which one is right? Even if you come to that determination, even by coming to it, you're going to say something wrong. And for me, that's just so incredibly freeing and not at all burdensome. Uh, you know, if we let go of that need to have what's right and what's wrong, you know, with a sense of certainty, you know, or if this book, The Sin of Certainty, and that's a lot of what it's about. We can't be as certain as we think we are. And that's actually a good thing because it presses us on to an immediacy of communing with the Creator, which I think is like sort of the point of all this, right? Okay, so I think, here's what the way I would put it. And again, I think this is this is a great question, and you know, it comes up with my students all the time. You know, by the way, you know, I, I speaking of which, my students, we teach I teach a course on the nature of biblical interpretation, like what is biblical interpretation? A fancy word is hermeneutics, and I teach it by not just like abstract principles derived from modern exegesis or something, but we look at the entire history of Christian interpretation, actually starting within the Old Testament itself, like how, like how Chronicles uses Samuel and Kings, blah, blah, blah. And the point of that whole exploration, and we, and we go to modern and postmodern interpretations, feminist, womanist interpretations, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, all, all sorts of things that are sort of off the normal beaten path for evangelical students. And the point of the whole course is, look how diverse the history of Christian thought has been on how to handle pretty much anything. And what that does is it should give us some humility. So I want to suggest that, you know, the question, um, which one of these ways is right and how we know, I think the more we mature in faith, which we're all doing anyway, you know, but I think the more we mature in faith, the more we will not see that as a central question to ask, at least not a first kind of step question to ask. I think curiosity, since we're talking about the Creator, is a very big thing, it's very important. And what can I learn even from these different ways of looking at it? Even things that seem very weird to me, because there's a lot of weird stuff out there. But it's weird maybe because of our filters, not because it's actually objectively weird. It may just be we're not used to seeing something. <clears throat> so is there something in other approaches, other points of view that might, you know, draw us out of our own selves and out of our own need to be certain and to something bigger and maybe something better? And, you know, maybe what does God honor more? <clears throat> the, the search for a definitive clarity and like here I know exactly and I can stand here and never move. Or does God honor more our humble searching after truth? And I'm not, see, again, I don't want to be sort of self-contradictory. I'm not saying, well, it doesn't matter, anything goes. But the fact still remains that even if you cut out half the diversity in the church, 
there is a tremendous amount of diversity in Christian thinking about anything throughout history about things that, you know, we're not going to have definitive answers about. There's diversity throughout history. There's diversity right now in the church globally. And maybe there's something about that that actually reflects something about the nature of God. You know, I just think that's a very curious way of thinking about it, a very good way and healthy way of thinking about it. Okay, anyway, we'll stop with that. Those are my uh, hat hair, uh, kitchen remodeling, ruminations. Of course, the coffee thing is there. The kitchen's not even done, but the coffee's going up because that's the way it's going to happen. Um, anyway, but thank you, <clears throat> as always, for pressing play and, um, and for supporting us. You know, I say this every time because I want to, and I mean it, for supporting us on uh, Patreon. It means a lot, and it allows us to do things, and we're <clears throat> working on expanding some of our services. We'll let you know what that is when we get to it, but we have to raise a little bit more um, income to do some of the things we want to do, which we benefit people you and others out there who might be curious in the things that we're talking about. Okay, folks, blessings to all of you, and see you next time. Bye-bye.